All righty. Let's see if this is all looking right. Looks like we're getting it there. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to good to be back here with everybody. Running a little bit crazy this morning. Hopefully, your your days are going well. Uh, I'm going to just launch right into it. We have a bunch of things to do here today, so I figured I'd, I'd just get right into it. Real quick, some housekeeping <clears throat> measures. If you have any questions, there's a chat in the, in the control panel uh, as part of your uh, of your 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 uh, screen. Whoops, back down over here. You can just chat me questions or shoot me questions. Uh, make sure that you entered your audio pin so I can unmute you if we get into a place. I'd love to have the dialogue. And, and very much uh, appreciate that kind of um, of interaction. Let me see who we have here that I that I recognize. Um, we may have a, a contracting officer pop on with us uh, later today, which would be super. Not sure about that though, uh, but it, it is it is entirely possible. As well as some of our partners that we work with, every once in a while pop up, and people that I like to to call out from time to time. So make sure you enter your audio pin. Don't enter 36. That was one of my old audio pins. Uh, but figure out what yours is by opening that audio panel. And then we can talk. Just a little bit about ISI Federal. We're, we're located near BWI Airport, just outside of DC and outside of Baltimore. And, uh, and we spend a lot of our time there. Uh, some of our clients that you'll see here, uh, some of them you'll recognize as being large, like Northrop, and then other ones are smaller. Um, and and they, they run the gamut across uh, manufacturing and service-oriented industries. Um, and some of them are IT, and some of them have nothing to do with, with each other at all. Uh, and those are, that's what makes it very interesting about what we do and how our approach is to the marketplace and how we can generally help you reach uh, some folks in the federal space. Um, there are three primary clients that we serve, at least the types of clients, uh, the do-it-yourselfers, where we help them market and plan and train and, and kind of get an understanding of what this marketplace is so that when you're going into it, if you haven't been into it before, uh, that, you, um, that you're going into it with eyes wide open. Uh, and if you are in it, we can help you grow within that space. And, and that can be in your do-it-yourself mode. Or we start to assist where uh, we augment your sales force with uh, either folks that are making phone calls, doing drip campaigns, marketing components. Uh, for you, helping you market better, doing the grunt work uh, of following up, or we can help you manage your sales team um, to make help them be more effective in the federal space. And then finally, we handle all aspects of the federal sales, which includes outsourcing the whole thing. It's kind of a bolt-on business development arm where we can actually work for you. We look and smell like you. Our cards have uh, our names on your cards where you outsource that, and it's a we build it, you bank. And if we do all of it, we will guarantee results because we will, we, will, um, we will be in control of your federal business development. About this particular series, every second Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. Uh, is when we do this. We work through basic elements, but we also go down into some of, some of the specifics where we also connect you with specialists and experts. And today we're going to be diving into a, a particular area that, that would be of interest to a lot of you folks, both in reference to your federal campaigns as well as your um, as, as well as reaching out to your private sector but the objective is to provide this as a forum and, and to get you to a place where you can win federal money and, and get access to that federal money and that's why everybody's here uh, it is 2012 uh, according to the federal calendar many of you know this from uh, from last month uh, and the, the federal calendar goes from October 1st through September 30th so uh, we're, we're now in continuing resolutions, and that has an effect, but it is a brand new year for the federal space. Now, about this, what you should expect, uh, we're going to fire hose you. Every, every time we do this, we fire hose you, and we don't follow the pact. It's straight talk, and we'll give you help where you need it, and that's not necessarily where you think you need it. Uh, most of my day is talking with entrepreneurs and helping them decide whether or not they want to go into the federal space and what it's going to take to do it. Uh, I'm not going to blow sunshine. Uh, one of the ways that we, we help you understand that is to take a look at your marketplace, and we'll see how we do that a little bit here as well. As far as help where you need it, we help you target your market, position your company, and leverage the relationships that we have as well as the relationships that you have, whether you want to do it yourself, 
get some help from us or to outsource the whole thing to us where we build it and you bank. Okay, for, as far as the agenda is today, <clears throat> the federal marketplace we're going to review. We're going to talk about some of the statistics that happen, and we're going to concentrate today on market segmentation. Last week I did a, a, a speaking engagement with the CPN, the Christian Professional Network here in, in Maryland. It was the largest of its, of its kind. Um, where we dove into market segmentation and how that's part of the process that we use at ISI Federal to help you identify this market and then develop a market-driven strategy around the information that we have. Um, we'll, we'll review how the government buys, specifically some of the things that we've identified in, in decision clusters. We'll talk about some 2012 initiatives and helping you develop your strategy. We'll also talk about uh, contracting officer buying motives and what you can do right now. So there's a bunch of things that we're going to have on the plate for today. And um, if you have any questions, again, just pop it into, into that, uh, that right-hand side or, or raise your hand so that I, can, um, that I can answer those. We have a pretty good, pretty good group on here today, so I can't unmute everybody uh, and have everybody in, included. So uh, as far as the marketplace is concerned, this is an enormous marketplace. We, um, if you're not already aware of it, it's about $425 billion. And even if they cut, um, you're still looking at an enormous marketplace. Let's say you cut 10% cut of that, which they'll never do. But if they did, you would, you would, you're still looking at an incredible market. Uh, and this is, this is regular type of spending. 2.5 million contracts. Now, 23% of these are supposed to be set aside for small business. And they usually don't meet those goals. But they do buy everything. And this happens on a local and all the way up to international type of purchasing. But depending on what you do, you can play in the federal space. And the chances are there's enough work within your region for you to be able to service it. There's 85,000 buyers. And they are the number one customer in the world. Now, with all that, here's some of the things that are happening out there. 92% of the companies that try to get into the federal space fail. And that includes 80% of those that get GSA schedules. They lose their schedule. How can that possibly be? When you get a GSA schedule, money falls from the sky, right? Well, no. 50% of them get no dollars, zero dollars on their, on their uh, GSA schedules. And another 30% 30 don't reach the $25,000 minimum. Now, I don't know what business you're in, but if you can't make $25,000 in a particular market, I would say that's a categorical failure. And this also includes 8A, service disabled, women owned, veteran owned, whatever you want to, to call these, these are also included in them. 5,000 of 9,000 8As don't get any dollars. How can that possibly be? You work so hard to get your 8A, and you have, you have essentially uh, the ability to be able to get reduced competition and, and because of either minority, now it's a little bit different with 8A, but it's, um, it's more an economically based. But even so, disadvantaged businesses, you're supposed to have advantages that happen there, uh, no matter what. Uh, but no, it doesn't work that way. Most 8As also graduate and then disappear. Now, sometimes this is a good thing, but oftentimes people don't, they don't even use their 8A status. And, and then they lose it, and they, they're, 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 they're lost after that. But um, the average cost of this to companies is $55,000. That's for losing. That's for failing. So if you're, if you're thinking about dipping your toe into the federal market space, I'm, I'm here to tell you, don't do it. If you're thinking about, you know, hey, we'll try this for 30 or 60 or 90 days, and we'll see what happens as a result of that, don't do it. Take your money, go to Vegas, put it on red, and spend. It, it, you'll, you'll have a whole lot more fun. And, and you'll wind up potentially even doubling your money on a very, very short period of time. So how can you remove the obstacles to your federal sales? Whether you're doing it now or whether you want to get into it, we're, we're, this is what it's all about. It's targeting the right people, positioning your company, and leveraging those relationships. And this is all about winning. And we're going to talk about some of the components of what makes a winnable opportunity in a little bit. But first, we're going to dive into what is market segmentation? Market segmentation is essentially identifying your sweet spot. And when we do that, before we even start into, in, into that sweet spot, what is the most important thing in business? It doesn't matter what you do, but the most important thing in business is profit and increasing your profitability. So when we're thinking about the kind of folks that we're doing business with, it, it revolves around profit. 
And market segmentation is about an 80-20 rule that's in place, and you'll find these all over the place. I don't know how, how often you all uh, have done this and seen how 80-20 applies across your businesses, but it certainly applies to mine, and it applies to just about every business as we've done consulting in the past. So 80% of your profit comes from 20% of your customer base in most instances. So what we want to do is we want to talk about and look at specifically these, this 20%. So if, with their, your market segmentation, 80-20 rule, is about understanding your marketplace, specifically how your customers relate to, to your service offering. So the real question is, who are your best customers? And I'm not talking about in the federal space necessarily, but generally, who are your best customers? Because if you can figure that out, the chances are you're also going to be able to figure out how you can operate best in the federal space as well. And now what makes good customers? Like your top 10. And most instances when we do this, if I ask you your top 10, you can get past the three, four, five pretty easily because they're identifiable, right? But sometimes you run into, after that, you're going to run into some difficulty unless you've already done this before. And, and so the first thing that we want to do is, to, what's your top 10? Why? Why are they your top 10? Well, your CFO is going to look at profitability, right? The bean counters are going to say, man, we need to know where they are profitability-wise. And by and large, your CFO is going to be right. But your VP of sales is going to talk, start talking about sales cycle. How long does it take to do this? What is the effort that's required from a sales component to be able to get there? Your COO is going to talk about what's the ease of management of these, these guys. Are they a pain in the butt or a couple of, you know, pain in the neck, pain in the butt, right? Uh, the, and, and then in the front, the front lines is a pain in the neck or pain in the butt, right? So those... These are the types of things where you can start to understand for yourself what happens there. And what we like to do is we like to, to create a target matrix to say, okay, a spreadsheet that lists all your client uh, attributes uh, of saying, okay, how, what makes up these folks? And how are they related? Because somewhere along the line, if you do this right, you will see that they are related. And you need to include some intangibles about you know, pain in the neck, pain in the butt thing. So ask your customers also what, why they bought from you. What made you different to them and how you got to be their, um, their, their, best, their best resource for what you do. So we want to ask them why, what, and how you got there. Right? So all of these impact your profitability. And I know some of this is basic stuff, but... Customers are either going to inhibit or enable you to be able to be profitable. And you, you and I all know that one, there are some of the customers that we have that we, should have never, that we should have never taken, and they wind up stopping our resources or being the wrong type of customer. So this is what your, your market segmentation is about. And one of the things that we do is, is as we establish this, if we're, if we're targeting only the best companies that absolutely need what we sell, then we don't have a problem in selling with integrity. We don't have a problem trying to fit a square peg in a round hole because if we're paying attention to what makes up our best customers, we know what the best customers look like and we also know what the other customers look like that aren't our best. So how to target your best customers? List your top 10 customers and profitability, ease of management, length of sales cycle, and staff impact. If you do this, if all you do is this, you're going to be helping yourself. Then what are you going to do after that? is you, you can use this information because it's quantifiable. You can get Dun & Bradstreet. You can con you know contact them for lists. And you're going to know them when you see them. Again, whether they're good, uh, mediocre, or poor prospects for you and where you need to spend your time. So oftentimes, as we look at companies, they're targeting the wrong type of thing. Or they give the, the same weight to a client, a customer, you know, in the sales, putting them up on the board. Hey, I got five five new deals this month. Well, all five of those deals, you know, they, mo they may only be worth a couple of thousand dollars in profit, but they, they look up on the board, they look the same, and we, we treat them the same when instead we should be looking at your A and B list of, of customers and clients that will enhance your, your profitability. And if you direct all your proactive resources to your best prospects, you can double your profit without adding any overhead. Can you imagine? So the only way you can do that is target only your best potential customers and get rid of your worst clients. Send them to your competitors. Let them deal with them. 
if they're already a bad client, and know in this environment, you're thinking, man, I can't, I can't get rid of one single dime. Well, this is the best time to be reviewing your, your clients all the way across the board. Get, get in touch with, with somebody who understands market segmentation and looking at your, your client base to understand whether or not they're good or, or best clients. Now, we all take clients that are strategic in nature that have a value outside of, and this is the intangibles, a value outside of your general profitability. Sure, loss leaders, all that kind of thing. But generally, if you practice this, you will win. Any questions about, about that particular part? We've never gotten into this with, uh, within, this, within this realm uh, here with, um, with ISI Federal. I don't see any questions yet. If you, if you want to, you can chat to me or, or ask questions. Or you can you can raise your hand. I'm looking to see if anybody's raised their hand, and nobody has. Okay, we'll dive back into the presentation. But again, make sure your audio pin is is plugged in if you raise your hand, so we can we can do that or or chat me a a question. So we're going to move on. So if we're now if we understand our market and we understand what our sweet spot is, then we can develop a market driven strategy around that to be able to reach the federal space, and that's what we're talking about. And in this instance, we're going to follow the money, who's spending it, what are they buying, how they're buying, and, and this includes, by the way, because a lot of our folks, if you've never played in the federal space, you need to know the preferred vehicles that they have, the regularity in they purchase, and the types of P NAICS and PSC combinations. If you're not familiar with NAICS, that's, that's your industry um, codes, kind of the SIC codes of, of yesteryear. And PSCs kind of float underneath of these NAICS codes. So you can have a, a NAICS for your engineering, which is an enormous bucket, by the way. You've got engineers that are, that are doing civil engineering work. We have some of those folks. And then we have uh, our, you know, architectural engineers. And then you have aeronautical engineers. All of those are in the same bucket. So it's very difficult to, to parse through engineers unless you're looking at some of the PSC combinations or the uh, product service codes that, that fall under those, and, and they float between those. I'm not going to get into those right now, but they do, they float around between those. So the biggest thing you need to do is align your offerings with their buying pattern. Now that sounds simple, but if you don't understand what makes them buy, then it's very hard to align your offerings, because I'm telling you, they're, they don't necessarily care what you have. Some of them do, but some of these folks don't. So how does the government buy what you sell? There's three, well, there's three primary components to the federal buying process. You have your program manager or project manager. You have your contracting officer. And then you have your technical representative or COTAR. Now, some of these are, are different names. Um, but essentially, your, your technical representative uh, supports your contracting officer. Let's concentrate on these folks, because these are the three, three pillars or the three legs of the stool, if you will, of someone that is going to procure services or products that you offer. And we call these decision clusters. And, and you'll see how these things work. First, you have your project manager or program manager. They are the ones that are responsible for driving initiatives down, sometimes from the President of the United States. Some of the things that you see nowadays that's there. Uh, green computer, uh, green, uh, anything green, uh, not just computers, but uh, you know, wind, uh, solar, uh, anything that reduces cost and reliance on energy. Uh, cloud computing is huge right now. Uh, security is always both physical security as well as um, IT security in just about any fashion. They're still spending money there. Anything with cost cutting and cost savings is, is important. This is a double-edged sword because if they save money on one side, then you know, let's say they save $10 million on, on lights and electricity because they replace the bulbs in all their facilities. They save $10 million. Well, politically, that's, that's a hot potato because if they lose that, month, that funding, that $10 million, then they're going to lose that this year, next year, and continuing years. So there's a continual impact on that from use it or lose it spending, which we just went through in September. And there's political aspects that, that are involved with decisions and, and, um, and initiatives. Uh, environmental components wind up being politically charged. Um, but these are the folks, the PM is the, are the folks that, that are responsible for driving these initiatives down. They're measured by different performance metrics. Some of those are, make sense, and some of them are, are tied directly to 
particular initiatives. They are responsible for finding new ideas. There's nobody that's really cutting bleeding edge out there in the federal space. It takes, it, it, it takes some inertia to be able to get things moving, but they are the type of folks that are out there looking for new ideas, and they are influenceable and specifically within the scope. And real quick, you and I are the folks that are responsible for making sure that information is included in the scopes of projects. And if that's the case, we can influence the process in which that they're doing to be able to help carve them, carve out a little bit more of a market for you and push some of the competitors at bay. Uh, contracting officers are the next leg of that stool. They're busy, or at least think they are. Um, and my, the, the folks that I know know exactly what I mean about that. A lot of the contracting officers are very busy. In fact, they're working constantly through September. And, and, they, and I have times when we see uh, purchasing uh, mechanisms come across my desk on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, faxes that are being sent out, and, and things like that. They will not teach you how to work with them, and this is critical because you need to know how to do that. Um, they're risk averse. Their job is to move paper, and I'm not, going, and I'm not trying to, to make that sound like an insignificant event. What these guys do is they have something that they need to procure. They buy pencils and pens and computers and lumber and engineering services and, 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 uh, and computers and phones and cars and planes. They, they're responsible for moving a whole lot of these things. That's why they're not overly concerned about your qualifications. What they care about is how can you help them get through that process of moving that paper. They do select the purchasing mechanism. Most of you are familiar with RFPs, maybe not so many with blanket purchase agreements or uh, BPAs, uh, GSA is a uh, General Services Administration, uh, IDIQs, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. These are different purchasing mechanisms that you can use that they use in order to be able to buy from you in the private sector. They can't just, in most instances, if it's less than three thousand dollars. They can they can just buy from you and put it on a credit card, and there's not a whole lot of questions about that. But anything above that, there has to be some kind of competitive measure involved. So. They're responsible for de developing the contract documents, which includes making sure that everything is in line with requirements with the FAR uh, and establishing the process. They do find the fastest way. They're interested in the fastest way to purchase and administer the contract post-award. So they're very important people to you as, as you're developing your federal business. Now, the COTARs, same kind of thing. They're busy, or at least think they are. Their authority on a purchase is granted from the CEO. However, they usually report to the project manager in some form or fashion. That's why these people are important, because as you start to identify opportunities, you need to know where they are in the food chain and how they, and how they operate within their organization. They're also risk averse. They're not interested in trying things new because their butt's on the line. Uh, and while it's very difficult to get fired from the federal government, you can get talked about bad around the water cooler, and you can have a reputation of, of making bad decisions. They assist in assembling the technical requirements, which is critical for you. They look, for, they look to other agencies or other similar purchases for government standards, but they're also looking for certifications that help them be able to protect their decision. This is another place where you can influence them. They assist in mandatory requirements, and this is both of these, real quick, let me talk about that assistance and mandatory requirements. If, you, if the requirement is that they have to have five people that have this particular certification level and they also have to have 10 years experience in this particular agency, what do you think they're doing there? They're, they're, they're helping push away people that would be low, that would be higher risk, one. Two, also people that, that could potentially do the work, but they don't want to deal with all the com competition. And, and have to deal with you know, 50 or 60 responses when they can get the, the cream of the crop by putting in particular certifications. And where do you think those certifications come from? For people like you and me that feed that to them. So here's how decision clusters work. You have these three groups of folks. And generally, they're hanging around in the, in the, in the same places. Um, you have your, your project managers and your contracting officers and COTARs. And all of a sudden, there's an opportunity or something that needs to be done within these agencies. And, th and this is where your decision clusters start to form. And then they revolve around these people kind of join at the hip for a specific need. 
And each one of those have, has the, their different requirements or their different buying motives, if you will, within this particular project that is suited for you. So when you're selling to these folks, you have to know what they're, who they are and, ha and how they're positioned and what you're supposed to be selling them. So these folks wind up getting starting to create these opportunities all over. And even now, there's opportunities that are, that are happening, but they're constantly moving and they're constantly forming around different areas in the federal government. And this is what kind of gives you an idea of how to find those key targets within all the different agencies. Here you have the Department of Transportation. You have the FHA, Federal Highway Administration, FAA, we know what those guys are, and these other, these other agencies and sub-agencies within these organizations. And these folks start to appear as the primary folks that are responsible for obtaining contracts of, for, for what you sell. This is what's important to you. Who are the ones that bubble to the top? They do it repetitively. They may not only do that, in fact, they probably don't usually only do that. Very few places do you find that are stovepiped within the organizations that, that will find contractor, contracting officers that are constantly buying the same thing. Every once in a while we do. We see it at Defense Commissary Agency. We see it at FAA sometimes. But generally speaking, you're going to have people that are buying all across the board, which makes it challenging for you because you have a particular product, and that by nature is niche-oriented these folks, and they really don't have a concern about what, what your product offering is when it comes to the contracting officer. So these targets are everywhere. They're, they're in the State Department, Justice, Labor, all over. And the question is, who within these folks are buying what you sell? If there's 80,000, 85,000 plus, and they're scattered all over the world, who is buying what you sell? When you take a look at like a market segmentation of the federal space, and you take a look at how your market works within the federal go government with what you do, you'll start to see who in the agencies are buying what you sell. Now, you know, a lot of times if you're, if you're doing defense-oriented things, you're talking about Department of Defense-oriented operations, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, those kinds of things. But you'll be surprised that about these other agencies. And I'm always surprised. So I'm running into agencies and sub-agencies that I've never heard of. And I've been doing this for years when we start to look at, at who, is, who is actually spending the money. Now, specifically, who is spending the money? What we want to know is who within, fits within your sweet spot of contract. Because if you're talking about $10, $15 million and, or $100 million or $5 billion, you're going to be banging your head against some pretty formidable competitors if you're talking about a $5 billion opportunity. There isn't anybody out there, the SAICs, Deloitte's, Lockheed's, all those kind of guys that are going to want parts of that. But where you are as a small business, medium-sized business, maybe 5 to $50 million or so, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more, but if you fall within that category, chances are you're going to be looking for uh, some lower-hanging fruit, stuff that flies under the radar. So here are the folks that are responsible for that. And those are the things that, that we want to be able to know when it comes to your key decision clusters. Who are the ones that are responsible? And how do you fit within their different roles and different buying motives and what their objectives are? Because every one of them is influenceable. you just got to know how to influence them influence them. I'm going to open up for questions real quick because uh, of the types of things that we've been talking about. Let's see if uh, what we have here. How do you find, uh, Jerry wants to know how you find those people. Jerry, that's, that's a great question. We're going to get into that. That's a, that's a good softball for me. <laughs> I do appreciate it. Um, we, we actually have some mechanisms to, be, to help you find those folks and we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and how do you know that they actually are buying what you sell? Well, that's one of the things that we like to do is try to figure that out and, and help you with that. There's a lot of noise that's out there. And because there's, they're buying different things, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit that, about that in a few minutes. Um, if you have any additional questions, just let me make sure nobody's raising their hands here. I don't see anybody raising their hands. Okay. 
What to expect in 2012? You're going to have lower spending in total dollars. There's, there's budget cuts that are happening, and everybody is really, really tight right now. Nobody's spending any money that they don't have to. Most of the things that they're spending on licenses, continuing kinds of things that they've already, they already have in place that they have to continue. Um, these restrictions are by continuing resolution, CR for short. You're, you're going to hear a lot about that. Budget cuts are doing that. And we also have election year positioning. So we have a lot of turmoil that are affecting these things, that are causing the lower, lower spending in total dollars. However, what we're seeing is we're seeing more smaller revenue projects being developed. So instead of doing the, the $100 million project, they're, gonna, they're breaking that out into smaller sub-segments uh, so that they can release that to, to smaller companies. And this is really important because this is great for small businesses. And it is terrible for procurement because all of a sudden they have to do 10 times the amount of work than they normally have to do. So what does this mean for you? Smaller projects means more manageable proposals and a better chance of winning, of course. And then what does this mean for procurement? If they're overloaded, they have to go to the people who make their life easier. So all you need to do is help them make their life easier. This has been the mantra for federal business forever. This isn't anything new. It's just that the criteria kind of changes a little bit as these initiatives are being driven down for, for small businesses. So. How can you get there? You develop your strategy around market intelligence. And we're going to talk about market intelligence specifically. It's one of the components that ISI Federal does. And since this is a free webinar, you get the benefit of, of some shameless plugs and some direction from us. And if you're developing your, your, your strategy around market intelligence, understand your federal customer market segmentation. Then, hang on a second, my thing's wigging out here. We can help you identify decision makers, find those decision clusters, and ultimately understand your competition. This is important when you start to talk about competition and, and identifying these. This is how you get there. Your, your federal customer market segmentation, identifying the decision makers, developing your decision clusters, those three legs of the stool that we talked about earlier, and we use our competition to guide us down that path. What's beautiful about this, if we use our competition, we can identify who's winning, who's buying from them, how they're buying, and ultimately steal their wheel. Now, some of the folks, you're not going to be able to get their customers. But if we can identify the people that are buying, remember that other, that, that other uh list that had the, the buyers, if we can identify those folks, then we can figure out a way to combat them. And we'll know whether or not, you know, maybe, maybe we don't want to bid. Maybe that one we can't get our hands around because those folks absolutely are in bed with our competition. It's going to be too hard to, do, to, to get them out. They're, we can tell the scope is big for them, and we'd rather not spend our time or effort doing that. But ultimately, people buy from people they like. Relationship plus need equals a winnable opportunity. And this is critical. Not every opportunity is winnable, folks. You can't possibly win all those opportunities that are out there. In fact, some of those, you don't have a chance at winning. We just did, uh, we just did one for, for, for uh, uh, an IT group, web development. IT group, and they, they brought us the opportunity, and uh, we looked at it, and we said, I think it's baked. I think it's big for your competition. They've already been in there for five years. And they said, but they're not even offering anything good. They're not offering anything different. In fact, they're regressing. That's all well and good. They may not even be going the right direction. And you could probably be able to help them tremendously. But the fact of the matter is, is that opportunity is big for that competitor. And they, they, threw, they said, we're still going to try it anyway. I said, that's good, because I think you should. You want to make sure that you know, that they know that you're on the radar screen. The challenge is it was for another five years. So if you lose, you're still looking at another five years after this. And lo and behold, it went to their, to, to their comp competition, and they were, they were like, I can't believe they would do that. We had a much better proposal and all that kind of thing. But you know what? People buy from people they like. And if they already are pleased, then it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to win. And if, if you did, they didn't have a relationship, they knew there was a need, 
but they didn't have a relationship. Their competition had a relationship. Relationship plus need is a winnable opportunity. Could they have lost? Yes. Guess what? My guys were cheaper. The other guys were more expensive. But they were already in there, and they were already baked. So, winnable opportunities, what do they look like? They look like minimal competition. Did you know that 50%, 50 to 95% of opportunities have less than five competitors? Let's take a look at something. Event services, one of our clients uh, does event services. For 44,122 contracts, $1.6 billion. This is an event services, folks. 97% of it, $1.5 billion, went to less than five competitors. How can that possibly be? Everything has to be open and full open to competition. Does it really? Does it really? How can you get there? Positioning and understanding your federal buyer. This is what we're talking about. How to get to that place where you have less than five competitors. Isn't that where you want to be? That's where I want to be. So you find the right first we need to find the right people that need to like you, help them like you by giving them what they need. Let's talk about what contracting officers need. They need political cover, they need technical cover and they need pricing cover. How does this happen? What, is, what exactly are you going to do to, have the, have to provide them political cover? Well, let me tell you. This happens because of your approach. If your approach is right, you can give them political cover just by your approach. If you're, if you're coming through the regular processes where you're watching Fed biz ops, I'm telling you, you're not going to give them political cover. The next thing is your capability being good at what you do. Are you good at what you do? Of course you are. You're in business. You want to be able to grow your business. That's your capabilities. That gives them technical cover. The third is pricing cover, whether it's GSA or some other, v some other way of being able to say, hey, we, in, in general, usually in small businesses, this is exactly how you do it with your GSA schedule. If you don't have one, we can help you do that. If you do have one, we can help you market it because if, if you're if you have one, you know you have to market that thing, otherwise you're going to lose it. The biggest thing is to make it easy for them. Tie it up in a nice little bow and give it to them. Now, this happens on procurement that's larger and smaller. But if we're talking about really what's important with the smaller opportunities, and I say $750,000 and below, depending on your industry. If it's construction, it's a little bit higher. But what we want to do is we want to be able to find those, cap those, those pieces to make it easy for them. And easy is not what everyone else is doing. And I call it the freeway because it's free for everybody to do. You're familiar with uh, OSDABU, Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization, or your Small Business Administration Liaison, okay, right? Here's the issue. They have no decision-making authority. I love these guys, but they can't make a decision to buy anything. They really don't have any influence on the scope process. So where does that leave you? You're, you're talking with somebody who's not a decision maker, who has no ability to affect the decision making process. They can help you to do introductions, which you can absolutely you can use their help for. But if you don't know who you're trying to reach, are they going to tell you who it is? Probably not. So the biggest thing you need to do is know who, if you're going to use these folks and help, and have, help them help you, the old Jerry Maguire thing, help them help you get to the right people, tell them who the right people are. Tell them who you need a relationship with and who you need a meeting with so that you can get some face time. That helps, and that works when you're talking about these folks. Then there's also NAICS notifications. This depends on the contracting officer, whether or not they know what NAICS to put it out under, and there's a lot of noise. If you're monitoring NAICS, you know you're seeing things that are coming from things that have nothing to do with you, nothing at all to do with you, and you have to read each individual proposal. Absolutely, but should you do this? Yes, you should do it, but if you're depending on it, this is what everybody else is depending on. How about Fed biz ops? Everything is supposed to be competed. Everything over $25,000 is supposed to be competed on Fed biz ops, right? Okay, well, let's talk about this. Remember this from earlier on? 2.5 million, million contracts in a given year. Let's take a look at Fed biz ops. I pulled this the other day. It was last week, so it's not completely fresh. But I did a search in the past 365 days. Let's take a look at this. The past 365 days last year. Right? 48,137 hit Fed biz on. Where are the other 2.4 million contracts? Where are these? 
that's what I need to know. That's what you need to know. Because if you're going to go into the RFP process, Fed biz ops means lots of competitors, lots of bids, political exposure. The higher you are in the dollar amount, the more political exposure you have. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes years. We just, we just got awarded, um, Janus Associates, one of our clients, just got awarded a contract as, as a partner, as a teaming partner. Three years it took from the time that we did the RFP to the time that it was awarded. Are you kidding me? That's a crazy amount of, of a long sales cycle. Now, it's a $400 million contract, and, and there's, there's 16 different competitors on there. It's good. It's a good contract to have. It still needs to be marketed. Not one single dollar is going to come to you just by sitting there. So, but that's what an RFP stands for. And, and Fed biz ops. This is how we see Fed biz ops. Everybody's trying to go to the same place at the same time. And you have tremendous amount of comp competition. And unless you have the ability to dispense with them, is this really easy for you? Is it easy for, for, for them as far as procurement? If you want to minimize the competition, you need to avoid the freeway. Everybody else is on the freeway. You got to figure out who's doing the purchasing and get to those folks to be able to influence that process before it hits the street. If it hits the street, if it's already on Fed biz ops, I'm telling you, the chances are, I'm not just talking about a little bit of chances, 95, 98% of the time, it's already baked for somebody else. Somebody already had influence on that RFP. And if it's not you, who is it? It's one of your competitors. So help where you need it. Know your market, plan, dedicate resources. Whether you're going to do it yourself, get some help, or you want to outside the, outsource the entire sales effort to us, that's what we can do for you. Just to give you an idea, Grant Grasnick, he's one of our, our clients. Um, we're instrumental in helping them identify the key decision makers in their marketplace. We provided them a, a clear plan and saved them hours. Uh, one of the things that we're offering today, uh, we'll go through it. If you know the people, these are the, the folks that we were looking at before, number by number of contracts. Knowing who's doing the buying, knowing in the agencies, which agencies are doing that, let the market determine the agency targets for you and let every single person in that market that has, that has the ability to buy from you, let them get to know you. Once, if, if that's your strategy, the chances are you're going to win. And you won't be up against everybody all the time. You will be up against some formidable competition. The federal government is operating without your services right now with the people that you want to reach. You have to have a compelling message to them and make sure they know that you know what you're doing in order to be able to, to do that. So the key is that these folks are all decision makers or they know who the decision makers are. So connecting those dots, six degrees of separation, Kevin Bacon game, whatever you want to call it, being able to get in there and do that. This happens to be a perfect time to do business development. Here's why. Let's take a look at this. And most of the oh, most of the cycles in a given year, depending on your your uh, your um, service offerings and products and what what industry you're in, but most of the time you're going to see a spike of anywhere from 200 to 500 percent in September. Well, we just passed September. What happens after September is everything goes straight down. This is September, straight down. This is this. Uh, if you look at the next one, this is September and going straight down through, through the, um, through in in October, November, December. We're in a lull, folks. This is not going to change, and I'm not going to blow sunshine. And all of a sudden, there's going to be bazillions of dollars being cleared because it's not happening right now. But if you look at at the cyclical nature of the federal government, we're going to keep. We're going to be coming back throughout the course of the next year. And, and be building, and sometimes we have mini spikes as, along the way. We're going to have mini spikes as we're working through the continuing resolution and into the budgeting process probably early next year. There will be a spike because they're going to say, okay, this is the money that we have to spend. And right now they're holding all their money. So how come this is such a great time? October to December are the best business development months because you can reach people and you can talk to them and they'll talk with you. We're talking with hundreds of contracting officers every week. Why? Because our clients need to talk to them and make sure that they're still touching them. And they don't mind talking with you. 
talk about the Ravens. What a great game the other night, huh? Or with uh, Sunday night. And I'm sorry if you're from Pittsburgh, but we uh, we hammered it. It was great. Um, talk about football. Talk about hockey. Talk about skiing for folks out on the West Coast. Talk about talk about anything. You know, learning about folks. People buy from people they like, and just building relationships and building rapport. Talking about things that are important to them. Uh, yesterday, I spent about a half an hour talking politics with with a contracting officer. Didn't have any business, but I hadn't talked to him in a while, and just you know, shooting the breeze. And it's the best time to strategize and start planning for your September 2012, folks. If you're if you're thinking about the next 90 days being your saving grace in the federal space, I'm going to tell you it's not going to be. But if you're not using the next 90 days to develop for your September 2012, you're probably not going to make it either. So your 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 objective here is to build your strategy around September of next year. So how can we do that? One way we can do that for you is help where you need it. Capabilities review, $249 regular. We'll, we'll just do a review for $199. The federal intelligence, regularly three grand, $2,500. This is probably the most important thing for you to do right now. It's, it'll help you plan for the market. It'll get you the right people at the right agencies and your competitors' contacts so that you can start the process of peeling those of them away from your competitors. The other thing that we do at this time of year is we do an introductory blitz. How nice would it be to be able to, to identify two or 300 folks that are buying what you sell and then have us do the introduction process for you? And then what you do is you start to – when we do this, we generally have a 8 to 12% hit ratio just right out of the gate with dialogue with people. That means you're going to be following up with 30 or 40 people. And then if we do our follow-ups after that, if you need some help with phone calls and things like that, we can build that onto this. That's not included here, but the email introductions are included here, and we'll do the whole thing for $3,750, and, and that's over $1,200 over $1, worth of savings. So that's what we do for the webinars um, and, and, and help you get out into the marketplace. So help where you need to find the right people. We can also make sure your house is in order. If you don't have a GSA, we can help you get that. Um, your capabilities, looking over that, CCR, ORCA. If you already have a GSA, we like to see how we can tweak that, depending on what the contract and contracting officers are looking for, and with your certification. We can help you get in front of the right people with the right message. Make it easy for them to like you, and make it easy for them to buy from you, even right now. There are some contracts that are being let, but I'm telling you right now, it's, it's, it's thin picking because of the continuing resolution and the budgetary issues. Once we get through that, you're going to see um, that when, if, you hold it, if you hold your spending for three months, what happens after that? Even if you have a cut in spending, the chances are you've withheld all the spending that is necessary already. It's what happened last year. We had a banner year in September because everybody was kind of holding their money throughout the course of the year. And then they found out, hey, we, we can we can spend as much as we spent the, the previous year. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, uh, you have a Katie bar the doors <laughs> with, with the kind of spending that happens in September. So with that in mind, we'd love to help you remove your obstacles for federal sales and targeting, positioning, and leveraging, and help you win. Um, real quick, resources, the Limerick process, um, as we mentioned before. Um, we, you can go to isifederal.com and see that. There's a free handbook that you can download, free survey that you can take to see if you're ready, if you're not in the, in the space, and there's all kind of feeds from government sites. Um, and LinkedIn, send me an invite. So uh, questions we'll get to now. Whoops, let me back up. Um, and we'll see what's what here. Hang on one sec. Hold on. I can expand this thing. Sorry, guys. Uh, where do we get the list of contracting officers and what projects they have? That's Ray. Hey, Ray. Um, I'm going to answer all these at the same time. What should we do to get a meeting set up with contracting officers? And never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I'm a little bit slow on reading that. Uh, so, so, Ray, I, apparently I just answered your questions. That's awesome. Um, and any other... Uh, 
let's see if I can find some others. Let's see. Okay, uh, back to that same kind of thing. Um, the the list of of the contracting officers. We do that with the federal intelligence, so that we can understand exactly who those folks are. Um, there's another question from from Sarah who was asking about the about the list in case that I didn't answer that earlier. Um, so that's that's what we look at. In fact. Um, let me dive into this real quick. I'm gonna let me look for something real quick as far as what that looks like. There's somebody who's asking how what does it actually look like? Um, hang on a sec, and I'll show you. And you can also download these on ISI Federal, but I'll show you the sample intelligence. There's two components of our intelligence I think that's important for you to see. One is um, if we take a look at the, the intelligence sample, um, this is just, uh, let me zoom out a little bit so you can see. So this is a sample intelligence, uh, and I'll be glad to, to post this. I think this is already there, though. If you go to ISI Federal, you'll find them. But we do an executive summary, so we look at a particular marketplace. And we'll take a look at, if you take a look here, with particular NAICS codes. Now, these are primary NAICS, but you're going you're gonna to see that we're not just concentrating on specific NAICS. Um, we look at the, the number of competitors that are in your space. You're going to find a lot because the, the government's buying from a lot of different folks. Some of those are, are key people. Other of those are not. You say $1.6 billion. What we want to know, really, if you take a look at, at $1.6 billion and 44,000 contracts, this is the average size. So some of those are going to be really large, right? And some of those are going to be smaller. But if you're a small business, these are the kind of things that I like to see. And it depends on your sweet spot. But if your sweet spot fall, we're looking for specific contracts within your sweet spot. And there, I love $36,000 because that means that it's a pain in the butt for the people that are buying. We give you some action steps. Uh, but here, here's um, the top 25 contractors. So you, you take a look here and you see their wins, 92 million in wins, 40 million in wins in, in this given year, um, 17, 15, uh, going all the way down to 4.7 million in the top 25. So you start, you're starting to see it kind of get diluted, right? Even in you know the top ones, they're making some, some good money. But once you get under, I mean, this one, lion's share, right? So, but even so, that's only 5.7% of the total marketplace. So if we go down a little further, we'll take a, a look at, by the number of contracts, we'll take a look at, at who's winning by number. And this is important, too, because there's 444 contracts with $7.6 million. That's, that's a nice place to be, where you're building $7.6 million worth of, worth of business, repeat business over time. I like those, uh, and most of my customers do, too. So then we'll take a look at the contracting officer, the agencies, Within that, let me make sure you're actually seeing this because one time it didn't work. Um, but we'll look at the agencies, so you can start to see the, you know, PBS, Public Building Services. You have two wars going on, so we usually see the Army and the Navy. Then you see HHS, um, Health Resources, right? Uh, that's that's HRSA, right? And then we we start looking at by the number of contracts. So Public Building Services are, uh, again, but. You're starting to see these numbers of 20,000 and, and seven, you know, 727 million. You know that those are more bite-sized contracts a lot of times, and we like those. And then we'll start talk, looking about um, purchasing patterns with the NAICS codes. See, NAICS codes are interesting because the contracting officer, they may decide that they want to put it out. They just don't know where to put it. Well, they know exactly who they want it to go to, and they put it someplace where you're not looking. And this happens on a regular basis, and that, that's because... They want to minimize the competition as much as you do. They don't want to respond, have 50 respondents any more than you want 50 competitors. And they already know that they have somebody they can trust. So we look at that all the way across the board. And another one is, is breakdown by, serv by product service. Because, oh, real quick, I want to go back to these. Let's take a look at this. Can I ask you a question? We're going to zoom in on this. This is important. Here's your, your company's primary NAICS. OK, this is all other NAICS, blah, blah, blah. But here's something. All other professional and scientific and technical services. What does that mean? Uh, all other support services, administrative management in, in general. You know, all of the support services, what? So 
Anything that ends with a 90 or a 99 is usually an other, like other general government support. Um, lessers of other real estate property, all other business support services. What does that mean? It, I don't know what it means. And the fact of the matter is, if you're not paying attention to where these things are popping up, and there's 41 contracts that popped up there, and there's these aren't like a whole bunch of them, but if you're not paying attention to those, you're going to wind up missing an opportunity that's running, flying under the radar. And the same thing happens with your, with your PSCs. If you're taking a look at, oh, here's one, R499, other professional services. I wonder what fits under that. Just about everything under the sun. And then you have other administrative support services. So anything that ends with a 90 or a 99, both in NAICS and PSCs, are of interest to us because these are the ones that are flying under the radar where the contracting officer is either not sure where it goes or knows exactly what he wants, but he doesn't want everybody else to see it. Does that make sense to, to everybody? So that's the kind of thing about purchasing patterns that we're, we're talking about. And um, I, was saying, I lost my question. I don't know where my question thing went. I just saw somebody pop up pop up their hand. Um, I don't see my question. Sorry guys. I'll find it. But here's the other breakdown by year. This is the way it looks like most of the time. Take a look at this. Spike. Spike. And it starts to drop. This is last last year. And um, you can see where sometimes it drops a lot lower than what you anticipate and that's where we are right now breaking it down by state, but most importantly, knowing that you're dealing with less than, than five competitors, and who are those people that need small businesses and their phone numbers? This is gold, folks. I don't, I don't send any of my folks out until I know who these guys are. It is probably the most important thing that you can do to be able to go through your process, and this is what we do in our intelligence program for for you to help you find those folks. So if, if you're interested in that, like I said, as far as our as far as the rest of these, let's see. Um, then we go through the competition. We also look for the competition and how they they go about their business. We also we supply you with the with the information that backs that up. Here's your key contacts in data format phone numbers and email addresses, street addresses, and this doesn't exist anywhere else. You can't get it from input, you can't get it from anywhere else. This doesn't exist. Um, and then we look at who was winning that, like Siemens, um, let's see, we'll look at, at, uh, at who was the actual, that's the agency. And then we have our reference contracts. So you take a look at Hilton Hotels. We're winning that one. Hood Corporation, Medco. Depends on what your what what it is that you do. But this is all importable. We can you can save it as a CSV file and import it into your CRM system. If you don't have a CRM system, that's one of the first things that we're going to recommend. Is as soon as you start going after these folks, let's say let's see how many key contacts we have here. Let's say we have I don't know. There's 493 of them that have bought these services over the past, six times over the past year. These are exactly who we're after. This is exactly who you're after. And um, being able to um, to find those folks and go after those, how are you going to manage that kind of that kind of marketing expedition to find the right people for you? So getting back to um, to our presentation, um, I think I left out my contact information. Most of you have that, but if you don't, it's uh, dlo at isifederal.com. Uh, again, that's dlo at isifederal.com. Let's see if I have one in here. Uh, run this down to the end real quick, and then and you'll, you'll have it for you. There you go. So, there's my contact information. You can reach me anytime on my cell um, or shoot me an email. Love to see if there's anything that we can do for you um, in regards to this. And let me see if I have any other questions. 
think I um, lost my question bar. See if I can find that. Sorry, guys, losing my mind. Um, okay, Sarah. Yes, love to talk with you later on about this um, and what you do um, and how this can apply to you. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email and I will absolutely respond. And um, other than that, any other questions or, or anything you'd like me to concentrate on? Always interested in finding some things from that we can do. I didn't even look for, for our uh, contracting officers um, this time. I don't know that anybody uh, posted. So, but feel free to shoot me an email with any questions that you have. Um, roll over. You can certainly roll and, and grab the, um, from ISI Federal, you can grab the, the handbook and see how that works. There's also samples of the intelligence components. And feel free to, to, to contact me with any questions or suggestions on how we can help you uh, reach this market and identify this market for you. Love to help you. We, um, we just welcomed on four new clients last week, um, which, uh, which, are, which is great. Uh, one is, is doing engineering out in, um, uh, in, in Oklahoma, uh, an IT services firm that came on board as well, and uh, a, um, someone that does uh, wealth management and wants to do speaking engagements there. So certainly we appreciate the, the business. And um, love to have you guys pop on. And other than that, if there isn't anything else as far as, as questions are concerned, um, I'm going to jump and wish you all a great, great rest of November. Happy Thanksgiving. And we will talk to you in December uh, where we'll be reviewing um, some of the things that you can do for setting up for your next, uh, for 2012, for the calendar year, uh, specifically looking for for things in, in 2012 in September. We're also going to be bringing, oh, I'm glad I remembered this. We're going to be doing some offshoots on, on this to, for uh, compliance and bringing on um, CPA firms that have, uh, re that have uh, history in the federal space and have um, the, the ability with, with, a le with the legal side to help you uh, make sure that you're in compliance and that's something that's, that's for, for folks that are already in the business. Um, so we'll be marketing, we'll sending out some marketing material on that. It will be free. Uh, we're going to have several, several different ones of those, and we'll also talk about, um, about GSA components and proposal writing later on, either in, um, in, uh, in January or February, as we get closer to, to when we're going to be needing to do more responses. So, Feel free, again, to give me a shout. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Great having you on board. Um, really appreciate you all um, joining me today. Thank you very much.